I love role-playing games. And in fact, I love them so much that I have actually spent my entire life making a career out of both making them, reviewing them, and taking part in them. But somebody in my community asked what some of the best mechanics were in the RPGs that I genuinely love. It was such a good question that I decided I was going to make a video for it immediately. And so today, my friends, we have an opportunity to talk about the most interesting RPG mechanics. Hello, I'm Kyle Ott. If you're watching this, thank you so much. Make sure you give us a like, share, comment, and subscribe. It really does help us out a ton. If you really want to help us out, you can, of course, purchase our games in the description below. And if you want to actually start taking part in the contest that we have going on, or if you just want to be a general part of the Desks and Dorks community, lovingly refer to it as the Dad Bod, uh, you can, of course, join the Discord. Links to all that in the description below. So, with that being said, what are we talking about today? Obviously, the most interesting RPG mechanics. So, I play a metric crap ton of RPGs. I review a bunch of them. I read a bunch of them. I have friends that make them. I have friends that review them. I have friends that edit them. I basically have just been spending the majority of my life in this. And I want to shed some light and some love on some of my favorite role-playing game mechanics of all time. Full stop. Period. However, and this is a very important little however... Um, I talk at length about a lot of different games, and so I am going to have a couple caveats for this. One, I am not going to mention games that I have talked about a ton. For example, I love Transistor. Transistor's module system easily would have made it onto this list. Bioshock Infinite easily would have made it onto this list. Dragon Age Origins easily would have made it onto this list. I've talked about those a bunch. Two, I also talk about role-playing game mechanics a crap ton, so things like Fiasco, for example, are also not going to make it. Same with things like Dread, another one of my all-time favorite role-playing games. Three, I am not going to be talking about any of the games I have written or worked on. So, no level one anthology, no after the rain, no a fear within, none of those things, okay? We cool with that? Everybody cool? Cool. So, let's talk about some of my absolute favorite role-playing game mechanics. One of the things that I think is the most fascinating part about Ocean's Eleven, and I promise this does actually matter for the purpose of our next game, is how easily and quickly and loosely this film plays around with the continuity of time. It seems like, in this narrative, the characters are always one to three steps ahead of the law, or the enemy, or whoever is standing in their way. It winds up being such a contrivance that it stops being a nuisance, and it actually circles all the way around to being endearing. And that's really what my, one of my favorite role-playing game mechanics ties into, because we are talking about the flashback mechanic from Blades in the Dark. I've talked about this game a little bit, but I, I feel like I would just be remiss if I didn't mention how much I love the flashback mechanic. It's one of my favorite parts about the system, and in fact, it's not one of it, it actually just flat out is my favorite part about playing Blades in the Dark. So, how does it work? Let's consider for a moment your character is scaling a rooftop, and all of a sudden they are beset by rooftop snipers. You, as the player character, can go flashback. I actually stashed a bunch of high quality muskets in the chimney of the roof that I am scaling, or I scattered small arms across multiple rooftops in case I was ambushed. The game master cannot tell you no, that flashback occurs. Now, you do take a penalty for this, and we'll talk about that in just a second, but again, it's one of the coolest things about it. Or for example, let's say you're crossing a giant bridge and it starts to move up faster than you thought ahead of schedule. So you, golf flashback, I actually bribed one of the bridge workers to leave me a grappling hook with a really nice high quality rope so that I could use it just for such an occasion. Now, the caveat with this flashback is that when you call for a flashback, it essentially fills up a doomsday clock for every encounter. And when the doomsday clock gets filled, bad stuff starts happening. For example, uh, the city watch can get called, the demon, the occultists in the basement of that nobleman's mansion that you're trying to raid, uh, unfortunately finish the summoning, you know, etc., etc. Why do I love this mechanic though? <laughs> it's there's a number of different reasons. One, it completely cuts prep time out of the game. If you're like me and you have played a lot of role-playing games, you'll know that sometimes players, despite all of their wonderful, wonderful features, players can sometimes just lean way, way, way too heavily into prep time. I have played whole sessions that have been spent just planning, not executing, but planning um, the attack on a location or what to do next in a given narrative. This can be awesome in small doses. However, 
extrapolate it over a large campaign or long campaign, I find it to be very frustrating. And what I love about the flashback mechanic is when you're playing Blades in the Dark, you cannot plan for a score, which is those events that we're talking about, whether that's, you know, making a rooftop heist or breaking across that bridge. Those are examples of scores. You're not, you're like legally not allowed to plan for that. You have to just immediately execute. And this means that players are forced to adapt and be flexible. I love this because I think, at least in my opinion, um, the best kinds of storytelling are flexible, they're adaptive, and they're interesting, and a system that forces both players and game masters to lean into the adaptable elements is a good system. And finally, it just really helps you live out the heist movie fantasy. I love the Ocean series. I love to leverage the television show Leverage. And in fact, I love any of those things where a bunch of wonderful little gentlemen thieves all get together and wind up working their way through a very difficult event. So, of course, naturally, I am going to love a system that is both reminiscent of those films and allows you to capture the best parts of them. There is something so cool about a player who's like, oh, there's no way out of this, and then someone just gets a really big shit-eating grin on their face and just goes, um, actually, flashback, and they just crush the system. It's one of the coolest things about Blades in the Dark, and it's one of my favorite systems in any role-playing game, full stop ever, period. But now we're going to talk about something else. We're actually going to switch gears, and I'm going to talk about something I don't talk about a ton on the channel, and that's video games. And in fact, it's two systems from a game called Dark Cloud. It was a PlayStation 2 original and a wonderful RPG that essentially the world is done, the world is done for, and you are collecting bits and pieces, fabrics and scrap from the world and rebuilding it to, you know, make it okay again. And so what you're looking at right now is the top-down view of the opening level village. So again, you're starting to find the houses, the rivers, the bridges, the paths, the trees, the windmills, everything in this village that was scattered in this apocalypse. You are slowly recovering from the dungeon and with the power of magic, and a, uh, I forget what the MacGuffin is called that lets you do this, we'll call it the Dark Cloud Glove. But with the power of the Dark Cloud Glove, you're able to rebuild the village. So you get a top-down view like this, and then you are actually able to enter into the game world that you have created. This is interesting, at least for me, because when you are in the village, you will get access to new dialogue, new items, and new out-of-dungeon options based on where you put different things. So for example, if you put two people who, if you read the lore of their backstories, are in a relationship with each other, if you put them close to one another, chances are you will either get a special bonus item, discounts at the shop, or special events that will help advance the story forward or unlock optional side content. If you put them far away from each other, you won't get those things, which means that you, as the player, are forced to engage with the lore of this world in order to actually rebuild it. So again, welcome to Ludo Narrative Resonance. That's a great term, and it's a really great thing to have happen. But not only are you forced to engage with the lore of the world, but you actually derive a substantial gameplay benefit from engaging with the lore of the world. By putting the world together in a way that the, you know, it was before the cataclysm, you are able to derive some sort of benefit. But that's not the only thing that Dark Cloud does well. I have included here um, a list of different physical weapons, but you don't just level up in Dark Cloud by finding items or by helping the world grow. Your weapons themselves level up to the point that there are massive, multiple, like, hundred node evolution charts for the different weapons that you can use, evolve, and grow in Dark Cloud, which means that if you have a certain weapon or playstyle that works for you, you can essentially ride that weapon until it grows, and then you can basically make that a huge part of your character's build in the game. And it's also possible for you to unlock new upgrades for the weapons by building the towns back a certain way, which is just awesome. If I, you can't tell already, I love these mechanics because it enforces that progress is not just on the individual. I find that in role-playing games, if you only give me a traditional leveling system, I'm not sure if I like that. I think it's part of the reason that Pokemon is so compelling as it is, is because you're not just leveling up one being, you're leveling up six and trying to match your team to the things that are going on. Just like that, you're not just leveling up your character, you're leveling up their character, the weapons they have, and the world that they occupy. This also means that every single dungeon run results in some amount of improvement, right? Which means if you're bad at the game, like I was as a kid, 
you're not just wasting your time. You might have died before you could get any useful upgrades to your character, but you probably still managed to nail or grab some useful upgrades to your weapons or the overworld, which means that the game actually is pretty good and fair about difficulty scaling because you're always getting something. And the last genius part is that every part of this system is designed to get you interested in the rest of the system. For example, I loved the weapon upgrades. As a kid, that was the best part for me. However, I did not want to engage in the base building until I realized engaging in the base building, the world rebuilding process, got me additional upgrades for the weapons. In doing so, I became deeply invested in the lore of the characters of this world because the game Trojan horsed meaning into what I was doing. I never would want to have gave, never would have wanted to. I can speak real words. I have, would never have wanted to engage with the world rebuilding process if it hadn't given me the weapon rebuilding rewards. However, because it gave me the weapon rebuilding rewards, I was able to engage with that system. By engaging with the world building system, all of a sudden, I wanted to engage with the other parts of the game. And by engaging with the other parts of the game, it made me want to engage with the weapon again. And the wheel, the flywheel, just kept turning. Dark Cloud is a masterpiece of making sure that every part of your design is multifaceted, but that every part of your design very gently and very organically feeds into the rest of the designs. It's flawless. I really love it. If you know me, you know that I love Conan the Barbarian. I love sword and sorcery. I uh, particularly love sword and sorcery when it is Bronze Age focused. Again, it's part of my love of Conan the Barbarian. And when we talk about Bronze Age role-playing games, it's really hard for us to talk about something other than Swords Without Master. And I actually hovered over this wonderful uh, Getty Images stock art of handing dice to people because that is the major point of the game. There is a shared set of D6s in the game, one for each mood. Either the mood is, I believe it is um, jovial or, or, or glum or serious. I forget the names of them, but either the scene is going in a way that is very triumphant for your character, is very fun, very lighthearted, and there's a mood for uh, everything is going wrong. It is a very serious scene. Um, when you are engaging in those scenes, what you do is you actually take the, one of the two communal dice and you hand it to another player. This forces the other player to take leadership in the scene and makes them answer a question or a concern or give a clarifying detail about the game world. And that, I think, is really deeply fascinating. So how does that work? I'll give you a wonderful example. My character, when I first played this game, um, was a thief. And in fact, the game rules tell you everybody is a rogue, not in the D&D sense, but they are just ne'er-do-wells, uh, adventurers, scumbags, <laughs> so to speak. But my character was actually an honest-to-god thief who had been friends with a golem, a sentient golem made of meteorite. At one point in the scene, this golem's character falls down, and the player for that hands a dice to me and says, how do you, as the one person that understands me, how do you comfort me? And it was a wonderful way for us to build a connection because I'd never played a game with that guy. That person I would consider a friend right now. Hi, Ryan Khan. If you're watching this, I hope you're doing well. I hope Bug Dish's development is going well. Ryan also writes RPGs. He has a really cool one called Bug Dish. You should check it out. Um, the other great example that I loved in this game is a small humble brag here. I actually got to play it with the creator of the game, a guy named Epidiah Ravishal, who you may know as the creator of Dread. I have to get it in at least once. Um, but at one point, our characters had sort of boxed themselves into a corner. We were playing as these elderly retired heroes coming out of retirement for one last job. And earlier in the game, I had said, oh yeah, we're all going back to this one inn in the wastelands. And somewhere in the inn, we hid something from our youth, our, our early days as adventurers. And that's gonna help us. And I had no freaking clue what it is that we hid. So what did I do? I took the dice and I handed it over to Epi and I said, hey, what did we hide in that tavern? I forced the game master to give additional clarification, which is something you can do with those dice. So why do I love this mechanic? One, it's pure collaboration. I believe genuinely that role-playing games are less about charts and leveling up and they're more about collaborative storytelling. And this 
echoes the kind of collaborative storytelling that we learn about in history class when we are talking about the first storytellers um, weaving the histories of their tribes and their nations around campfires in the early days of modern man. This is an incredible detail, and I love it because by picking up a single set of dice and handing it to a player, you are quite literally giving them the agency over not just their part of the story, but your part of the story as well. There's a profound sense of trust that comes with this system and a profound sense of engagement that comes with the system that I really do genuinely think is absolutely phenomenal. Uh, two, it really does help to drive new characters or people on the fringes. And what I mean by that is there are some players who I think struggle taking the limelight and that's okay, right? Role-playing is, and I've said this before in many of our rule books, but role-playing is a really difficult thing to engage with because it's a really... Um, personal one and it's one that forces players to adapt constantly and improv uh, very effectively which can be hard to do and can often scare people uh, what this mechanic does well is it offers um, a hook for new players to sort of latch onto. so for example my friend saying hey how do you how does your character comfort me he was giving me a hook that I could use to build out our relationship to flesh out that relationship that I might not have thought about otherwise but again, you can also use it for a player that you know has a good idea, but maybe just doesn't want to speak out just yet and needs just a little nudge of encouragement. And lastly, it's awesome for creating situations that exist outside your original plans. And the example that I gave, I had no idea narratively what our group would have been able to hide in this tavern to help us beat the big bad at the end of the game. And giving our game master a chance to help us flesh the world out a little bit made all of the difference. I couldn't have planned for that, and he didn't have that planned, but being able to sort of say, hey man, ball's in your court, it was a wonderful thing, and a wonderful example of how shared storytelling can be a powerful mechanic in a role-playing game. Um, I absolutely loved Swords Without Master, and it's one that despite um, Epidai Ravishal's incredible reputation and his work on Dread, I find that not a lot of people talk about Swords Without Master, and so I wanted to throw a little bit of love here. And um, that's pretty much it for today, my friends. I hope you enjoyed this video. Uh, again, please make sure that you give us a like, share, comment, subscribe. It really does help us out immensely. So it really does help us out a ton. And two, if you really want to get involved, we're running more contests in our Discord. Uh, the Discord link is in the description below. I would love to hear from you. We're running our next contest on dungeons and dungeon creation. Uh, but that's pretty much it for me, folks. Until next time, I am Kyle Ott from Desks and Dorks. You've been absolutely amazing. And I will see you in the next one. Peace.